the Dust Bowl. You know, you read about it in literature or in your high school textbook, but you don't really get a full appreciation and what the impact of the Dust Bowl was. It wasn't just like an isolated part of Oklahoma, it was the entire Midwest from Colorado on over and that dust, when it got carried over, blew all the way over to the East Coast. Conserving your soil is extremely important. When you don't have ground cover on this ground and it dries up and a wind comes, it blows. We all ought to be concerned about soil. I mean, you lose your soil and you lose your ability to produce food. Period. You could say that there's a symbiotic relationship between the environment and the beekeepers because we're the ones out driving around all the time as a career. Looking at the environment, we've listened to four generations talk about how the environment's changed. It's all about the water, it's about the flowers, it's really about the ecosystem, is it healthy or not? It's really, really, really changing. Our honey yields are going down in the United States in large part because we have uh, decreased plants. There's by far less uh, plants out there for the bees to be able to forage and work on. It is dramatically changing. We have within our ability to change to make it better. We have science now to make it better. One of the things that we know for bees of all species is that we have a lack of floral resources, that there isn't enough flowers out there to support bee health and reproduction. We have a lot of areas in the West which are under severe to extreme drought for numerous years. And many of those areas are no longer able to support a lot of floral resources. So our idea is to create these plantings, adding in plants like rabbit brush and a few other pollinator species. Can we create an ideal mix to survive in these very, very harsh climate that would support bees and be able to support reproduction of all types of bees, both honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees. This is sagebrush, and the, the rabbit brush is a more prolific flowerer. Honey growers, bee farmers, they like these because they flower later in the year. They're flowering September, October, when everything else is gone. Our expertise is developing plant materials and getting them to grow on the range. Of course, the Bee Lab is understanding the bees. Very different goals, very different approaches to very different things. Diana approached us and said, would you be interested in trying to stretch the pollinator availability out throughout the whole year? I'm the research leader, and so I said, sure. And then we started pulling things together. <laughs> He told the GPS to go a straight line down through there. And then we'll go through and put stakes on here that will show us the different seed mixes. Big ones are the sand foin. We've observed CRP ground for many, many years. Dry, dry sites, we've seen sand foin stay in. It's drought tolerant, the seed is cheap, it's readily available. It has a lot of flowers, it's a nitrogen fixer. I mean, it's an all around good plant. I've got a little measuring dynamic at my property in Petersboro to where I keep about 12 hives. It's just carpet of sand foin. And I get about two deeps per hive, which is really good. It's better than Utah's average by far. All that white stuff up there, that's all cheatgrass. Cheatgrass has a fibrous root system. It's an invasive annual that burns and burns and burns. The competitive nature of cheatgrass is really interesting. So one cheatgrass plant will produce 300 seeds. At five years, you'd have over 17 million seeds. That's pretty tough to compete with. Most of the pollinator plants have a taproot. The pollinator plants aren't competing with the cheatgrass for resources. So that's really what the grasses are for, is the weed competition. This was planted in 2018. Well, these things have survived huge droughts the last four to five years. I'm not coming in and I'm not adding water to it. I'm taking what comes naturally. We can produce flowers, but are we having bee impact with it? If you look around Great Basin, there's not a ton of flowers um, generally available for bees. It can be a pretty tough place to be a bee. There's just not that many resources for them. So as we continue to have bad droughts. This is an opportunity to put resources in the landscape that can support both uh, managed and unmanaged, so wild bees, and do it in a way that you don't need a lot of water. 
Today we've been sampling the bee community, so this is year one of the project. So we really want to know kind of what's the baseline bee community here, and then how will that change as the pollinator planting that we put in continues to mature. So as those flowers start to come out next year, will that support more bees than what we're finding today, or a different community of bees? We're just kind of collecting bees, both passively in pan traps and then netting, just trying to get a sense of what the bee community looks like. We found wild bees mostly. We found some honey bees as well. We'll take them back to the lab and get an expert ID, get them down to species, which is really critical for this community type work, having a species level ID. Some people focus on one narrow aspect instead of asking about how things work all together. I think you need to look at it the multiple pieces to get a true answer. So if you just go in with a microscope and look at one little area, you may come up with a very different answer than if you looked at it more broadly. One of the first things we learn when we're collecting bees is that swinging the net is the easiest part. If you're collecting tens of thousands of bees in a season, that's a lot of labor. It's not like you could just throw labels on it. They have to be very specific. So these end up in our National Pollinating Insect Collection. We now have over 2.3 million specimens up there, different bees from all around the world. This is an incredibly important project, both with looking at bee distribution across time, but also understanding like with the drought tolerant plantings, how that's going to promote bee health and reproduction of the bees associated with that area, especially where you have degraded croplands that could potentially be planted with these drought tolerant seed mixes. We've done two projects with Project Apisim, the honeybee interaction project with other species and the drought tolerant planting. For both of those two projects, one of the critical things we wanted to evaluate at the end was the reproduction of the bee species, honeybees, bumblebees, and then solitary bees. This is an artificial solitary bee nest. So within here, you'll have the results of a female's nesting success over the year. Our x-rays, we could actually go through and look and see number of cells that were in the solitary bees, how well did they reproduce. We could also begin to see disease symptoms. So here, these are um, Osmia bruneri larvae that are developing. You, this larva here looks like it might be dying of a chalk brood disease, a, a fungal disease. And at the end of the drought tolerant project, we'll put out these nests and ask just how well the solitary bees reproduce. In my lab, we have been rearing bumblebees to support projects that are funded by Project APIS-M. Uh, we've been rearing different species, including Bombus huntii. We have actually success in rearing another species, Bombus griseocolis, which will be used to investigate drought-tolerant plants. When we see bees in the landscape, we see them foraging on flowers, we see them buzzing around us at a picnic table. We don't see them in this manner, so it's really special to have the opportunity to see how these bumblebee colonies develop. Having John and his lab have this ability to create these colonies for us is critical to getting these colonies that we can evaluate how well they do. We know there are other bumblebee species out there, including Grisicolis, but for us to find their nests would be nearly impossible. We'll be monitoring them as well, but these colonies that John gives us, we can actually see how they grow and survive in these environments. These kind of methods, it's similar to honeybees in the sense that you're stocking the environment with a known number of bees. So it gives you a better idea of the quality of the habitat and its ability to raise bees. We can get that snapshot, but what underlies that? Figuring out what they're eating and how they're doing it. We have reference samples of pollen from the planting, and then we'll have reference samples from around the area. So we actually know what plants are blooming at that time, and then what that pollen looks like. Then when we make the slides up, we can actually see what pollens are actually making it into their provision. For the data for the drought tolerant planting project, we'll be trying to get a sense of, of how much they're benefiting from having the other plants there. The other thing that we've done is looking at what pathogens are there. There's a difference between having a pathogen and having a disease system. We don't know until we go in and sample directly using molecular methods to get an exact ID on what pathogens are there. So taking that, we can have all these pieces of data, assemble it, and we get a very clear picture of bee health. So we know from looking in the colonies, both the honeybees and the bumblebees, and looking inside the x-rays of the straws and cutting them open, what the health was, how well did the bees do and survive, 
but we'll get a clear picture of two is how the pathogens are being shared across them. And we have other projects ongoing too to ask more broadly about who are the pathogens out there and who are they found with. My dad taught me how to work with the bee labs. My dad always worked with them, I've always worked with them. It's been really, really neat to know these people and be a part of that research. Working with the labs, I get to understand what's on the forefront. How can I adjust to be able to, to be better in my career? I'm better at my field. We've reached our carrying capacity for managed beehives in the United States. This country used to have far, far more beehives in it than what we have now. It's how we're farming and how we're spraying. We're taking away our carrying capacities. The colony collapse disorder, the canary in the mine, it, it's all out there by, by nutrition. We continue to have record high losses and everybody keeps uh, wondering when is it going to stop, where's the solution? I think it's becoming more and more recognized that we do have to have working lands for agriculture, like lands that are being used for forage for livestock, also incorporating conservation into it. We don't have water to continue doing what we had been doing in terms of growing crops that require irrigation. So what are you gonna to do to protect that ground, that soil? And I think if we, with the help of Kevin Jensen, can figure out how to get plantings in to do double duty, both to help preserve the soil, but to create bee pasture, that would be ideal. Not only for honeybees, but giving something else for a lot of the other generalist bees that are in the environment. We talk about stewards of the land, Really, you need to be a steward of the soil. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do is maintain your soil.